Okay, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Our speaker in this session is Zoe Spedo from Oregon Health and Science University. Zoe is an instructor at OHSU and she also does instructional design support for the School of Nursing. We are very excited to have Zoe presenting with us today. Um, before I turn the mic over to Zoe, just a, a couple of housekeeping things as usual. Um, the first thing is that you are all muted during the presentation, but we do have the Q&A and chat available. So if you have any questions or comments at any point, please feel free to share. Um, we have Jeezy and Nina Fox from the board help monitor both areas. The second thing is that we don't have closed captioning at our live events, but um, closed captioning will be added in post-production. Okay, Zoe, now I'm going to turn the mic over to you. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, somebody's already gotten started with the question, but before we get started, um, and again, only if you want to, please introduce yourself in the chat. So what is your role um, at your school or, or wherever you work? And what is your experience with assigning and or teaching writing in online learning environments? And then just one word about how you're feeling today, because um, I feel like it's good in these days to sort of check in, see how everyone's doing. So we heard from Ariel, um, academic advisor and student success instructor, great and designs curriculum with your colleagues, um, some teaching online and feeling ready for vacation time. That's great. I just got back from some vacation time and it was, didn't go far, but it was still worth it to get away from the computer a little bit. So I'll give people another minute or so if you wanna introduce yourself. Great, Katrina, thank you. Microbiology instructor some short research reports and discussion forums, and great, been teaching online for a while. From Kari or from Kari, uh, teaching ESOL at PCC, great, mostly reading. Ooh, just gave your last final, congratulations. Larry, thanks for joining. Great, so we have, yeah, a couple ESOL teachers, which is great. Wonderful. Yeah, I mostly I wanted to get a sense of um, sort of who my audience is, you know, are, is it a group of fellow teachers who have done a lot of uh, teaching of writing online or at least using writing in the online space and it definitely sounds like, um, yeah, we've got quite a few people who have experience with that. Sorry, I haven't been able to keep up with any, everybody's name, but I'm seeing you all, all your responses come in and yeah, thank you so much. And Dawn, not feeling ready for school yet. Yeah, it's tough, the, being an instructional designer, it's year round in that sense, but I definitely feel you on getting ready for fall term. It's always kind of a big push. Great, well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, great to hear from you. And thanks for joining today. So today we're going to talk about using low stakes assignments to improve student writing. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been teaching undergraduate and graduate level writing for the past eight years, both face-to-face -face and online. And over the years, I've really come to observe that writing instruction gets learners most engaged when it's contextualized within other work and not separate from that work that they're doing. So for example, probably many of us grew up diagramming sentences or working on comma exercises out of a book. Um, and these kind of, from my observations, um, these kind of disarticulated ways of focusing on discrete components of writing isn't really the best way to get students motivated about learning it. Um, I think this is because the, there's a sort of exigence or urgency around composing a piece of writing for evaluation. And so students feel you know, a, a greater sense of urgency, um, as I said. So I currently teach in a program at OHSU um, called the Food Systems and Society Master's Program. Uh, and it's, I teach graduate level academic skills courses and directed study courses for um, graduate students. So the program's fully online 
And because of the way that the program is uh, geared, the admissions really take in students from any professional, any educational background, as long as they can demonstrate that um, the program is something that they're interested in. And so the courses that I teach really work to bring a very diverse group of students up, up to speed, if you will, um, in terms of the kinds of reading, writing, and research that they'll need to do at the graduate level. But I also work as an instructional designer for the Teaching and Learning Center at OHSU. And I bring up both of these experiences specifically because they've really exposed me to several areas of content that I am completely unfamiliar with um, and have really shown me how educational theories and writing practices can really be applied with some modification, of course, across various contexts. Um, and I didn't say this, but the reason the UNM logo is up there is good. That's where I did my graduate work, and that's where I taught uh, writing, both as a graduate student and as an adjunct for about five years. So it feels like I wrote these objectives a lifetime ago when I submitted this proposal. Um, so I've, I've done my best to address what my pre-pandemic brain was thinking when I wrote these, and I've revised them just a little bit. Um, which you'll see in blue. So by the end of today's presentation, you will hopefully be able to explain the importance of low stakes writing practice in the development of writing skills and the development of equitable writing assessment. Um, you'll be able to identify some online learning activities that are practice opportunities for various writing skills. Today's presentation is geared toward an online learning environment. And you'll be able to revise current learning activities that you have to include more writing instruction and feedback. So first, let's talk about the problem. Online courses often require that learners write a lot. This is, of course, not the problem, but this is a precursor to the problem. This is actually really great, in my opinion, but it is something that does need addressing. So depending on the online course, learners may write a lot or they may write a little, and that writing may be heavily graded or it might be lightly graded. But regardless of the content, learners will probably rely on writing at some point in the online learning environment to complete at least some of their online coursework. Even if that ends up just being writing emails to the instructor, writing is crucial to succeeding in the online environment. So often, this writing is graded both for content and for writing mechanics. So whether learners are engaging in weekly discussion boards or end of term research papers, learners writing in online courses is usually graded for both of these things. So this may happen less frequently in face-to-face -face courses where it's a lot easier to get learners to engage in informal writing exercises without grading them, such as free writes before a discussion or um, something like writing down questions to ask at the end of a lecture. But in an online course, most of the writing that learners are required to do does end up being graded in order to ensure that the learners are actually doing it. So typically, writing mechanics and style will only make up a small portion of a written assignment's overall rubric, but I have seen some instructors who give um, an automatic F or perhaps require a rewrite for a lower grade once they've marked 10 errors or a certain number of errors uh, in a learner's writing. But I don't think that this is very fair if there's no writing instruction present in the course. So this is the actual problem. This is especially true if a course's larger end of term summative assessments in a course require learners to perform a high level of writing. There are so many assumptions about when and where learners quote should have learned to write. Um, I've heard high school, first year English, the writing center, undergrad in general. Usually it's any time before this class. They should have learned to write these things before they got here. So our expectations as instructors around learners' ability to write is really unique in the sense that we want it to be present, we want them to be able to write well, but without often providing much or any corresponding instruction. And often when we do provide instruction, it occurs in feedback on summative assessments, such as final papers, where learners don't really have any opportunity to absorb the feedback and then try again before they end up moving on to another instructor. 
So just the same way instructors wouldn't expect learners to already know the content they're going to teach in their courses, I'm arguing that instructors should also not expect learners to already be experts in the kinds of writing that they assign in their courses. So the truth is that learning to write is a lifelong process because there is no such thing as universally, quote, good writing. There's no universal ideal of writing toward which we're working, though in the US we are often grading learners on their ability to write in standard written American English. So in any situation, writing is, quote, good insofar as it effectively addresses the situation for which it was written. So another way of thinking about this is what will pass for excellent writing in one course or at one workplace or on one social media platform will not work for another, sometimes only to the point of seeming awkward or weird for the situation and sometimes being completely incomprehensible. So learners might arrive in your course being experts at writing for a specific situation, such as um, a particular standardized test or the memos that they have to write at their place of work, but they won't have learned how to write for all genres, all audiences, all purposes, and all contexts, because that is impossible for any set of English or ESOL or composition courses or writing center tutors to address. So it's important that instructors in all disciplines take responsibility for the writing that they're asking learners to do, since English departments and writing centers don't own writing instruction and they don't own the responsibility for ensuring that it happens. So what does this mean for online instructors of any content, whether it's writing focused content or whether it's another type of content? Well, as I've already mentioned, there is so much writing already happening in online courses. So I'm arguing that it's important for any instructor who requires writing and who is going to grade learners on their writing beyond the content of what they're saying to provide instructional interventions where writing is already happening. So I hesitate to call this the solution to the problem that I've presented, but it is one solution that I have used in my courses and that has worked for my students. Um, instructors could do this in any course, but it's especially easy to do in online courses where learners, again, are often writing all the time. So as much as possible, I want instructors to make the most of these untapped opportunities to engage learners in the writing process and to provide guidance about what makes for effective writing. So where writing is already happening. So writing in online courses is already happening in discussion boards, which sometimes make up the bulk of learners' online writing, uh, whether it's prompted responses and peer responses, or informal discussion boards such as a general course Q&A. Uh, learners in online courses will probably also write a lot of emails or chats to their instructor, maybe their TAs, and maybe their classmates. There are also journal or blog entries, which are often used um, as more private exploratory assignments or even reflections rather than the more public discussion board. There are written quiz and exam questions. And then of course, any major assignments such as research papers, essays, projects, and presentations. So now I'm curious, um, and you can write in the chat, what are some strategies that you have used or encountered when assigning writing in online courses? And I say encountered in the event that you haven't um, assigned any writing in online courses or, or don't have experience doing that. So from Jennifer, we have, I have students discuss the topic in breakout rooms first, and then we debrief on the Zoom whiteboard. That's great. Yeah, so that's a great example of a, a synchronous strategy for sure. Um, so if you have that available to you in your courses, um, that's, yeah, I think that that's great. That's sort of the, the think, pair, share. Think about it a little bit, talk about it with somebody and share with the larger group. Um, from Kari or Kari, we have give examples, fill in summaries before students write a complete summary, practice summaries verbally first in breakout rooms. Great. Katrina says, I provide a rubric with the assignment so they know how it will be graded for content and mechanics. 
Yeah, that's great. And we'll talk about rubrics um, a little bit more later and how you can use them in some other ways too. From Timothy, we have starting with paragraphs before essays. I'm not sure I understand what you, oh, starting with writing paragraphs before essays. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And then from Dawn, we have, um, I provide many examples of what the end product should look like. Great. Instead of outlines. Got it. Thanks, Timothy. Yeah, I've definitely done that in my courses as well. Talked about the, the conventions of an intro paragraph or a body paragraph, for example. From Ariel or Ariel, we incorporate a weekly journal for free write. I also bring in essay prompts into weekly quizzes. I partner with our writer center to serve as guest speakers to discuss writing and security. Great. Great. These are all really wonderful. Thanks so much for sharing those. So the approach that I want to talk about today, and it sounds like a lot of people already are really familiar with components of this, but maybe haven't thought about putting them all together before. Or maybe you have, and we'll have some great discussion at the end. So I'm talking about putting together this combination of low stakes writing plus writing instruction, the, instru the um, instructional interventions that I mentioned, and feedback. And hopefully this leads to some happy students. So what is low stakes writing, in case you're not familiar, but probably a lot of people are familiar with it, if not the term, then definitely the practice. So low stakes writing makes up much of the writing in online courses that we've already been discussing, such as discussion boards. Low stakes writing is low pressure writing, mostly in terms of grade. Again, it is easier in face-to-face -face courses to have it be low pressure in terms of content, to sort of have you know one to five minute free writes, um, to have sometimes the one minute right mid lecture or, you know, various other ways that you engage students in low or no stakes writing. Uh, low stakes writing isn't defined so much by the content or the genre of the writing, but rather the weight that the writing carries in learners overall grade in the course. So in a face to face course, as I said, learners can do a lot of this uh, low stakes, even no stakes, since it's easier to get learners to write for the sake of writing when they're all sitting in the classroom together. There's sort of the, the feeling of, well, everybody should do it and the teacher is right here. Um, but in online courses, writing does often need to be graded in order to ensure that learners complete it. I have a little bit more luck, I think, with um, my graduate students, but when I taught undergraduate, I definitely, and taught online, I definitely had to find ways to um, engage low stakes writing in a graded way. So the obvious opposite of low stakes writing is high stakes writing. So there's no threshold for what counts as low stakes or high stakes in terms of grade breakdown, but the easiest way to think about it is that there are often several low stakes assignments throughout a course, making each one on its own pretty inconsequential to a learner's final grade. Whereas on the other hand, there's usually fewer high stakes assignments, making each one more impactful to the final grade. Um, so as we discussed, common examples of low stakes writing in online courses include forum posts or discussion boards, peer responses, journals and blogs, but I also include emails and chats in here because they usually have no effect on a learner's grade, but they are still expected to demonstrate a certain standard of writing. So that often appears in a syllabus um, where an instructor explains, you know, here are my expectations for the emails that you send me, or perhaps it's a first day activity. Um, I'm thinking of uh, some orientation activities and some programs at OHSU that I've seen where, you know, there's a mini lecture about, you know, professionalism and, and here's how you should be writing to your instructors or preceptors or, you know, other people that you're engaging with. Um, so even though these don't count for grades, there is still an expectation that students write in a certain way for them. So low stakes writing uh, is about more than just weekly assignments that check learners have done the reading and allow them to interact with it, one another. Low stakes writing really can benefit learners' engagement with the content as well as their actual writing. So I say actual writing and I cringe a little bit when I say that because I would argue that good thinking and good writing are inextricably linked. 
But we do know that there are some elements of the mechanics of writing that can make thinking more or less comprehensible to its audience. So there are a lot of benefits to low stakes writing, and I do have my references at the end um, if you want to look into them more. Benefits that learners in online courses are already getting a lot of the time. So we have an increase in critical thinking and learning, an increase in confidence with expressing ideas and just general comfort around expressing ideas um, in writing, but also just to a group. I've had a lot of students be very nervous about um, posting to a discussion board, sharing a draft in a peer review, and the more that they do it, the better that they get at that. Um, the ability to self-monitor their own writing and their own writing progress, and this comes again, um, and we'll talk about this a bit more later, with the element of feedback. Um, it, an improvement in higher stakes writing, so you know, the more we can um, provide writing practice and feedback on that practice, the uh, the stronger the student's higher stakes writing toward the end of the term or toward you know, other projects will be. It can also increase learner motivation um, because learners feel that they are able to, um, I'm sorry, I just completely lost my train of thought. Um, with learner motivation, they feel that when they are getting those sort of intervals of feedback, that they aren't just waiting to sort of find out, you know, what's going to happen at the end of this big project. They are really sort of able to see places where they can improve and they can start to work and do more of that self-monitoring. Um, it can also increase the transparency in the evaluation of high stakes writing. So how an instructor is going to evaluate their writing doesn't become a surprise at the end when they've turned in that final paper. And then it also leads to, and this doesn't really correspond to the arrow, because it's not increasing it necessarily, but it does lead to a shared vocabulary around writing. And we'll talk about this in a bit too. So low stakes writing is most effective when it occurs frequently, when it is graded informally, and when it is paired with feedback. So fortunately, as we've discussed, Online courses often require that learners write a lot, so much of this writing becomes low stakes due simply to the sheer volume of writing that students are doing. But an important part of what makes the frequent low stakes writing effective is the grading criteria and how it's graded and the process, um, which must truly be low stakes, and the element of feedback. So fortunately, feedback doesn't only have to come from instructors, and we'll talk about that a bit more later on, because obviously feedback is great and instructor feedback is great, but there's only so much feedback that we actually have time in a week to, um, to perform. So low stakes writing is almost always frequent and graded informally. That is sort of an inherent part of it. And when we pair it with writing instruction and feedback, we work toward getting the most out of these writing opportunities. So one final benefit that I wanna talk about is how taking this approach toward writing can really support equitable writing assessment. So when we only evaluate learners writing in summative high stakes assessments, we are making a lot of assumptions about who our learners are and what their previous experiences with standard written American English are. So we're also advantaging learners who have had the privilege to learn and practice and be repeatedly exposed to standard written American English. But when we provide instructional interventions around writing and engage our learners about their writing through meaningful feedback, we are much better able to meet learners where they are. So what many of us were taught to think of as quote universally good writing usually includes the grammar, punctuation, and style of standard written American English. And this version of English is not superior to any other version or any other writing standard. It's only more pervasive and dominant because of the supremacy of Americans and especially white Americans, both nationally and globally. So I really try to talk to my students um, in every course about how this version of English is just that, just, it's just one version. And that while they'll be graded on their ability to use it in my course, in future courses, and probably other places like work and even civic life, um, that it is by no means the best or the only way to communicate. So I emphasize very seriously that this version of English is limited in its capacity to effectively address things like genre, 
audience, purpose, and context for all situations. So thinking about um, the way that you would communicate on a social media platform versus the way that you would communicate in a journal article that you're writing. Um, it might just be awkward to communicate in really formal English on Instagram, for example, but people might understand it or it could be completely incomprehensible to them if you're speaking to them as if they're not a general audience, but instead um, an audience of experts. So I'm not going to stay on this topic too long, even though it is one that's really important to me, and I think it should be important to any instructor of any subject who wants their learners to write in standard written American English. Um, as a writing instructor, I am really torn between respecting the communicative knowledge that students bring to my courses and their linguistic backgrounds and then teaching standard written American English. But I also know that it's important um, that learning this version of English is important and it can have a lot of effect on students' lives. And until that stops being the case, I don't think I should be a gatekeeper by depriving my students of access to that form of privilege, of that linguistic privilege. So I don't have the authority in the programs I teach in, unfortunately, to say that we aren't going to evaluate learners on their ability to write in standard written American English. So if I don't teach it to them, I'm putting them at a disadvantage for later on. And this is really true of my grad students. So I teach um, a course where, that is introductory to the program. And if I chose not to help them with the kinds of writing that they will have to do um, throughout the program, both research papers, but also a master's capstone, I'm really not serving them well for what their goals are, for what they want to achieve. So this is why I try to problematize standard written American English for my students so that they can see it as one of the many tools that they will develop and not as the end all be all of how they should speak, write, and ultimately think. Um, these are a few resources that I use to teach this framework of challenging and examining standard written American English to my students. So one is a, it's on the TED website. Um, it's Jamila Eliascott's Three Ways to Speak English. There are a couple of videos here from the Voice of America Network. Um, and then this year I'll also be adding a Sao Inouye's uh, chair's address from last year's conference on college composition and communication, where he really talks about the supremacy of standard English and of English in general, but particularly standard American English. So if anyone's interested in more of these resources or talking about this, I'm, I'm happy to, to share. Okay, so we didn't talk about, um, well, we did talk about the presentation objectives earlier, but the one that we've gotten to so far is explaining the importance of low stakes writing practice in the development of writing skills and equitable writing assessment. And now we'll move on to the next ones. So now we'll actually go into how to integrate low stakes writing plus writing instruction plus feedback. And I've broken it down into five steps. So the first step is to work backwards. So identify some writing skills that learners will need to succeed in the higher stakes writing that you assign in your course. So I'm going to use, oops, sorry about that beep. Um, I'm going to use an example from one of my grad courses. Um, it's the annotated bibliography is the high stakes assignment that students turn in at the end of the term. And there are four sort of main elements of writing that I think are really important to writing an effective annotated bibliography. Summarizing, paraphrasing, paragraph structure, and then also citation. And these skills also help students prepare for the ultimate high stakes writing in the program, which is their master's capstone. The second step is to choose activities where learners can practice the writing skills that you've identified. So for summarizing, I identified a discussion board as being a great place to think about this. And thank you so much, Greg, for providing all of these links in the chat. Um, I identified as a, a discussion board as being a good place to practice summarizing. So what I do is I provide um, an introduction in my weekly overview. I provide a handout or a website, and we'll talk about that in a minute, about writing a concise summary. And then in the discussion board, students practice summarizing a source that we read that week, but they are encouraged also at the same time to be thinking about the structure of that summary using the tools that they learned about. 
Um, for paraphrasing, I have students do a journal or a blog entry. And again, I have an instructor introduction and a handout on paraphrasing. And by handout, I mean something that there is accessible online, not, not necessarily a paper handout. Um, and then I have them practice paraphrasing multiple sources that they've read. For paragraph structure, I also do a discussion board. I provide instructions um, and guidance around paragraph structure and topic sentences and constructing topic sentences. And then they do a post, uh, which is a draft of the first three entries for their annotated bibliography. So this is really, it's not a rough draft of the entire bibliography, but it's, um, it serves as a checkpoint, that's what we call them, um, of their progress toward that and so that they're learning and workshopping some of their early entries so that as they go on to develop more, um, I think they develop, it's like 12 to 15 entries throughout the term, um, that they're able to use what they learned through the development of the first three to apply those to the later ones. And then for citation, I also do a discussion board. Um, I provide resources to the Chicago author date citation style, which is what we use in the program. And um, I just include those as part of the week's reading list. And then while responding to the other readings from the week, learners, answers que learners answer questions about um, how the authors integrated outside sources in terms of content, as well as mechanics, such as the formatting of those um, citations. So I'm curious, what are some writing activities that you've assigned or encounter where learners could practice writing skills? So thinking about um, writing skills that you find particularly difficult for students, um, or that are really important to the kinds of writing that they do in your course. So thinking through what are some activities that, that either already exist in your course or that you could easily embed where, stu where they would lend themselves easily to practicing certain writing skills. Let's see, Sherry said, um, summarizing, summarize a movie, leaving out names, etc., and have others guess the movie. Oh, I love that. I think that would be really great. And I can see students um, finding that challenging, but also fun and engaging. Paraphrasing practice from Jennifer, students paraphrase idioms to practice paraphrasing ideas rather than finding synonyms for each word. Oh, that's great. Um, and I think maybe you were one of those people who said you were teaching ESOL, that makes sense. Um, Jennifer in face-to-face -face classes started doing a free write at the beginning of each class. I noticed that students writing improved with this practice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that would be such an easy place to do like a quick mini lesson about something. Um, and there, you know, there is some, there's obviously some tension between wanting students to free write and engage in the content um, and just sort of think through things and then also telling them, you know, but here, think about this certain thing in this certain way, you know, write about it in a certain way. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, from Kari or Kari, I give students a paragraph without a topic sentence and ask them to write the topic sentence. I love doing that. And my students have, I was very surprised how much my students love doing that. Um, and then from Dawn, I have students practice paraphrasing in small discussion groups using nursery rhymes, which is really hard. Wow, I love that. Uh, Sherry, using sources, students choose two readings from the course so far to incorporate into their first essay. Great. Six step rewrite process from Timothy. Rewrite a free write. I've definitely done that, and I, I do really like that using the free write as sort of their initial jumping off point and then having them continue to work with that content. And then from Donald, discussion posts with questions that prompt particular grammatical structures such as giving advice. Great, great. Thank you all so much for sharing. Okay, so step 2A uh, is decide what type of feedback will be most useful for this particular kind of um, writing skill that you want students to do. Uh, so step 2A is important because the type of feedback that will be most useful will of course affect the type of activity that you choose. So you can't really choose um, an activity such as discussion board or quiz or something like that without thinking about what kind of feedback is going to be 
a most useful, but also something that you can accommodate into your courses. So the main types of feedback that learners can receive is from instructor, from TA um, or TAs, from peers or other classmates, and from their self. So on writing elements that are more complicated or which you think or know that learners will find difficult, I tend to rely on instructor and TA feedback if you have a TA. I've, I've only had a TA very few times, but um, if you are lucky enough to have a TA, you can do that because you can really guide the TA about you know, how to respond to those. And then for writing elements that are building off of previously taught elements or things that you're pretty sure students are already familiar with, even if they're not um, necessarily experts in doing them, such as a summary. Uh, you can rely more on peer review and or peer evaluation and self evaluation. So I find that rubrics are a really easy tools here to use for peer and self evaluation, particularly once you get later into the writing process. Um, so if they're writing, say, you know, for example, paragraphs or annotated bibliography entries that may be used later in a final um, assessment or a more summative assessment, higher stakes assessment, then it's great. It can be pretty easy just to use the rubric and to say, you know, either evaluate yourself or evaluate your peer using this rubric. And it also makes sure that students see the rubric and use it as a tool rather than just as something, you know, that they sort of say, oh, well, this is how my instructor is going to, um, to grade me later. And then you can also use instructional handouts in this same way. So if there's, you know, here's the four components of a paragraph, you can use that instructional handout to really guide students through their review of one another or of themselves. So this slide's a little bit busy, but I'm just showing here that these are the four uh, writing elements that I chose um, that I wanted to focus on for my students writing the annotated bibliography. These are the four activities in green that I wanted them to do that I thought corresponded well with um, the activity. And then this was the kind of feedback that corresponded with that particular activity and again with the um, writing skill. So in summarizing, um, I chose a discussion board because I thought students had enough familiarity with the idea of summary that even if I was giving them new ways to think about it, a new you know sort of um, set of guidelines or instructions around it, that they would still be able to respond to their peers around what makes an effective summary. But I chose the journal and blog entry for paraphrasing because um, that would make it private just to me and I would respond to them. And I do find that students can have a tough time with paraphrasing. We do a lot of distinction between summary paraphrasing and quoting. And we really emphasize, um, particularly in working toward the master's thesis, that we want students to be uh, paraphrasing. We do not want a bunch of quotes. And I find that students are resistant. It's hard for them. They've, they've learned so much about quoting that paraphrasing can be tricky. So I use that as an opportunity to have some one-on-one -on -one feedback. And then for paragraph structure, again, I feel that students are pretty familiar um, with the idea of topic sentences at least but it also lends itself well to identifying components, you know, and, and um, doing peer evaluation. So did your peer have a topic sentence? Did they have these um, body sentences, conclusion, transition, that sort of thing. And then finally, citation. I also do the discussion board, but I make sure that I follow up on the peer um, feedback because citation can be so precise. I want to go in and make sure that um, after peers respond to one another, that I go in and, and just make sure that there isn't anything either that um, needs a little bit of correcting or adjusting or that they just missed and that I, I wanna make sure that we address. So the third step is to provide a brief, and I have brief in all caps, tutorial on the writing element. So it's really important to keep it short. You're not trying to drastically increase learner's workload in terms of what they need to read um, or your own workload in, what, in terms of um, content that you need to prepare. You're simply trying to guide the creation of learner's low stakes writing a bit more. So one way to keep this from eating up a ton more of your time is to use other people's work. So these are four of my absolute favorite places to direct learners. Um, and if you don't know about them, I highly encourage, and I, if I had the links, I would post them in the chat, um, but they're pretty easy to find. Uh, the Writing Center at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, they, their Writing Center has an amazing plethora of handouts on various elements of writing, everything from types of writing and genres and um, 
even disciplinary writing to really individual mechanics of writing such as commas. Um, the website Writing Commons has a lot of pages, uh, again, about a lot of different elements of writing. Um, I use the WAC Clearinghouse, which is Writing Across the Curriculum Clearinghouse, and it's out of the University of Colorado. And they've got amazing writing guides um, within the site, as well as lists of, as well as lists of resources, uh, and also some open access books, um, textbooks, um, textbooks on reading, textbooks on writing, a lot of really great material there. And then finally, the Purdue OWL, which stands for Online Writing Lab, which offers tons of great writing advice, as well as information about um, research and citation, especially MLA, APA, and Chicago styles. So if you use any of those in your courses, they've got sample papers to show students that, you know, a, a citation style isn't just about the citation, it's also about um, the whole format of the paper, and they really walk through student, walk students through a lot of the um, conventions around using research and writing. Um, let's see, Kari said, is one of those geared toward undergrad or less experienced students? I would say that um, actually all three, writing commons is a little bit more mixed in the sense that it's both for sort of professional and creative writers, but also I find some stuff that's useful for students. But I think um, the Writing Center at UNC Chapel Hill, the WAC Clearinghouse, and Purdue are all really geared toward um, undergraduate writers or in less experienced students. They really... Um, explain things in a really thorough way. Definitely some of the books on the WAC Clearinghouse are, are for a higher level, but um, a lot of their writing guides are, are still pretty basic. So whatever sources you use, um, I really encourage you to try to maintain similar terminology between them and the weekly overviews and the assignment instructions so that learners don't get too confused about what you're discussing. Um, and if there are unavoidable discrepancies in terms, just be sure to explain them. So for example, the one that stands out to me is when discussing paragraph structure, some sources use um, topic, body, and conclusion to describe the types of sentences that make up a paragraph, while others use topic, support, and point. So um, I prefer to use topic, body, and conclusion because I like to talk about paragraphs as if they are mini essays with an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. Um, but I do make sure that I explain to students that, you know, I'm gonna have you do this reading, but just so you know, they say support sentences when they mean body sentences, and they say point sentence when they mean conclusion, just to be clear, so that we can be working toward that shared uh, vocabulary around writing. So it's also important to include the feedback process in the assignment instructions, so to explain what the feedback process will be like to students. So in the course where I assigned the uh, annotated bibliography, I explain in the assignment instructions, so the, um, the biggest box here at the front with that thick blue around it, um, I explain that learners will be receiving feedback from their peers as well as from me. And then before completing the first peer review, I have them read a handout that I created based on a couple of other resources called Why Peer Review, which related to the discussion board instructions, which are there on the right, where it says um, annotated bibliography checkpoint number one, um, where they were given specific instructions on and guiding questions for responding to their classmates. So I really made sure that the feedback process wasn't just, you know, um, you know, respond to your peers, but that is really guided and that I really do like to explain the purpose of peer review because sometimes students are a little bit hesitant, like, well, this isn't the person who's going to be grading me. What do they know? Um, I mean, usually students are fine with it and they're pretty used to it by now, but I do think it's important to really explain that peer reviewer is just as much for the person whose work you're looking at as it is for the person doing it, that you get a lot out of, you know, examining someone else's work in this way. So the fourth step is to explain expectations for low stakes writing. So because learners are likely used to being graded on their grammar and their writing mechanics, you really want to be sure to explain your approach in the uh, assignment instructions or a weekly announcement, a weekly overview, or the syllabus, but definitely someplace where learners will see it before they engage with one of these types of activities. Um, and again, this is that place where that tension comes up of, you know, I'm asking them to do low stakes writing. I'm asking them to engage in something that is typically used in an exploratory uh, way, some place for them to think through ideas and content and, and work through problems, but I'm also asking them to 
write it in a certain way or to think about paragraph structure or to think about the way that they're writing it. And I think that it's okay to just explain that to students that this is still a place, a location of experimentation. It's still a place to try it out. I'm not going to be grading you on whether or not you're able to achieve that particular uh, writing skill. I'm going to use this as an opportunity to provide you some feedback or to get you some feedback in some way so that you can start to learn about these different um, elements of writing other than just at the end when we've got this big paper and other than just through the writing center or which you know it is becoming more difficult for students to access these days for sure um, but which you know some students can't go to some students don't have the ability to go to a writing center and get that kind of feedback so um, so I see sort of three main components of providing this explanation. One is a definition of your low stakes writing uh, as it pertains to your course. So here's how we will use low stakes writing in our course. Um, an explanation of feedback and grading in terms of your criteria, the impact on the grade, and then the timeline or the process for receiving feedback like we looked at a couple slides ago. And then some encouraging words. So it can be really hard and sometimes honestly pretty scary for students to try something new, especially if they think they're not going to be good at it. So it really helps if there's a sense, like I said, that curiosity and experimentation are going to be rewarded um, and encouraged, even if we don't see, you know, that that mastery, that level of mastery immediately. And then finally, step number five is to start out slow and assess. So don't worry about adding writing instruction into every single discussion board. You'll definitely overwhelm yourself and probably overwhelm your students. I think it's best to select a few elements of writing that you notice learners have trouble with or are particularly important to the higher stakes assignments and then to start there. So like with the annotated bibliography example, those four components are really crucial to me to writing um, a strong annotated bibliography and will be very crucial in how I evaluate those annotated bibliographies and whether or not I think that they effectively met the um, conventions of that genre. So also if you start slow it'll be easier to assess how well it's working in your course. So if you select a few writing elements that students usually struggle with you're going to be uh, it's going to be more easy for you to track how well they're able to learn them and to um, carry them off in the higher stakes writing that they do. Excuse me. And then finally, if you want, you can include specific points on the higher stakes assessment rubric um, that relate to the earlier exercises so that learners can really see the direct connection between the lower stakes work that they've been doing and the higher stakes assessments that they'll be doing later. And again, you'd want to point that out to them just so that that's very clear. So just a few tips. Um, one is to focus on one element of writing at a time. So, um, and this is mostly geared toward feedback and also in the instructions. So you don't really want to be combining paragraph structure and citation within the confines of a summary. Um, really just focus on one thing at a time. And this is where it becomes important just to pick a few because you, maybe you decide you want to do this every week or maybe you already do something like this every week. We used to have like grammar Fridays um, in one of my courses, but um, but if you're not sure or if you're afraid your students are going to be overwhelmed, just really focusing on one, however you decide to um, integrate it. And then contextualize whatever the writing skill is within other more content-based assignments. So if you teach a writing-specific course or a language-specific course, you can still integrate different writing elements into other kinds of content-based assignments. Um, focus your feedback. So really have a brief discussion of the student's performance with the writing element. You're not trying, again, to drastically increase your workload. Um, and then refer students back to the instructional materials as needed. So you don't need to worry about um, explain, re-explaining the entire thing. You can direct them back, say like, hey, you're not quite there yet, but you've got this component, but maybe pay attention to you know, the second page of that handout where it really explains X, Y, and Z. Um, don't worry about changing the impact on the grade. Low stakes writing can still be whatever um, grade you gave it. Just because you're asking students to think about their writing in a little bit different way and to be a little bit more mindful with it, um, it can still be pass, no pass. It could still be no stakes if you have opportunities for no stakes writing. Um, this is just a way to help guide them, to help expose them to other components of writing, again, before they get to that last 
or the later higher stakes writing. And then as we talked about, um, vary the feedback. So if you can't possibly respond to that many students writing, and I do not blame you if that is you, uh, just integrate peer and self-review using rubrics or guided questions, um, the instructional materials that you provide. And I, something I love to do, and my students, I was surprised at how um, well they responded to it, both undergraduate and graduate, they love to do a group review of what um, one of my teachers called an interestingly problematic example. So using that as sort of the central text of the discussion board, basically everyone does a peer review of one article, but when thinking about a particular thing. So like, let's look at this article and talk about source integration and how this um, person engaged with outside sources, or let's Let's look at this article and talk about paragraph structure or talk about topic sentences or talk about coherence um, anything like that I think that um, that is something that they really like to do partly I think because it's published um, often the article is published and it gives them a chance to see that you know published writing doesn't necessarily mean it's perfect so there's also things that they can point out to so finally I want to talk about some of the doubts around this I've been talking about this as if it's uh, you know, the end all be all and it's amazing. So doesn't focusing on writing take away from content, take time away from content. And I argue that learning increases with meaningful engagement. And there is a lot of uh, research around um, a practice called writing to learn, which is a form of low stakes writing um, that really shows how much this kind of writing can benefit students. And the writing is that meaningful engagement. So writing doesn't have a place in certain courses. This is something that I definitely hear a lot. Um, but I think that if students, like I've said, are going to be evaluated on writing, then they really deserve guidance on that writing, um, both in terms of reducing your workload when you go to grade their higher stakes writing, in terms of making them more successful on that higher stakes writing, but also, again, from that equity standpoint, that equitable stance, that we don't want to assume that all of our students are at the same level or um, have the same experiences with standard written American English or whatever type of English we're going to be evaluating them on. And then finally, well, I can't possibly grade any more than I already do. So again, mixing up that feedback, keeping feedback brief, and making exercises low stakes. So maybe you have some higher stakes assignments now that you could switch to lower stakes and make them just a little bit more um, exploratory and um, curiosity inducing for students. So also the idea, again, is to improve learners uh, writing for the higher stakes writing, as well as establish a common vocabulary for discussing writing. So it may cut down on your grading time on later assignments overall. So our presentation objectives, we've talked about these three main areas. And then we're at, uh, we've just got about eight minutes. So if you want to share something that you'd like to try after today's presentation, um, or if you just have questions, I'm, I'm happy to take some questions now. Yes, uh, we do have a few questions for you. Uh, Jizi, would you like to um, share some of the questions that we collected? Sure thing, sure thing. Um, let's see, from... Oh, I love the picture of your dogs, thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it's... Uh, Cut her up front and Gracie being the big boss in back. <laughs> um, so Ariel asked, do you use word or character count for grading? Um, that's a great question. I do in an online course um, typically, and I do explain to students that I'm not asking you to meet a word count because I care so much about 500 word responses. I'm asking you to engage to the, uh, I'm asking for the word count because I want you to engage with the content to a certain degree. And so that's sort of um, my justification for the word count. But also because in an online course, you can't be there to ask the follow-up questions. You can't say, um, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about why you think this is nice or why you thought this was good um, or why you liked it. Um, so yeah, it's partly to make sure that any peer responses that students are giving um, are going to be valuable to those peers as well. But I, I, and I do use them in my grading, but it's very minimal. It, like in a five point response, I probably would take off, I don't know, a half point or to one point for, um, for not meeting the word count. Okie doke. 
Yeah. And uh, Timothy uh, had a question. Um, what are some of the best practices for peer reviews that really work for both writer and reader? Hmm. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think that if you can pair peer review at all with um, then a self-review afterward, so having a student um, take the feedback that they've gotten and then look through the paper and sort of and see um, if they're able to observe in their own paper things that they observed in someone else's paper. I think sort of showing that um, that part of the process that we don't get peer reviewed just to turn in the same draft that we already had. We get peer review so that we can revise and so that we can um, start to learn a bit more, you know, about what's going to make our paper better. But we also read other people's work so that we can learn about writing. You know, there's that saying that, like, to be a good writer, you have to be a good reader. So I do talk about reading both, or peer review, both as a reading process and then as a writing and revising process. Um, I don't have, off the top of my head, I don't have any, like, concrete strategies I would use for that, but I'd be happy to, to follow up with that um, if you wanted to talk over email. Um, there's another question. Um, you mentioned the standard, you mentioned standard academic, uh, sorry, you mentioned the standard American English multiple times. Do you have any advice for instructors who have both domestic and international students in class? How can we ensure academic, academic equity? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've taught some courses where there were a lot of international students who did speak English, um, but they spoke, you know, what someone might call like a global English. And I did have students do some readings, um, and I could dig them up, around global Englishes and how English now is really not um, relegated to America or Britain or Australia, um, or I should say the UK, um, but that it really has become a global language in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, that's really an interesting question because it would depend on what the instructor was comfortable with evaluating. So if you knew, um, like I'm not sure I would know enough about someone else's version of English to be able to say whether or not they were um, meeting the sort of conventions of that standard. But if you feel comfortable with that or if you feel comfortable with having students share um, more about the standards and conventions of their particular um, version of English that they speak, then I think that that would be a really interesting conversation and, and that could help with some of that um, assessment process in, you know, if you're going to say, well, I would grade you down for, for example, this is a really basic example, but spelling color with a U and somebody else said, well, no, but I learned UK English, so U is actually correct there. Um, if you felt comfortable engaging in that, I think that that would be really fruitful. Uh, one final question. Um, what are some tips to help faculty save time when providing writing feedback in an online environment? Yeah, I think um, I often have a document open that basically has responses either that I know I'm going to have to give or that once I've given it once or twice, I'll put it into the document and that way I can copy and paste it into other students' responses um, into their feedback. That has been most useful for me in a lot of ways to, especially when you're giving something like in, um, individual feedback. But I have also done a lot of global feedback. So I might, um, in an online course, and this worked really well, I kept a document for each student and for each, they had three projects. And for their first project, I had their written feedback. And then I sent that document to them. And then in the second project, I put the feedback in the same document. And that way I was able to say, you know, I've already mentioned this in the first time or something like that. So they got a document that had all their feedback, um, but that was very minimal. And then at the week after I submitted everybody's grades or was done grading, I would send an email to the entire class, an announcement or an email um, and say, hey, these are the main things I noticed in these projects. Here are the, you know, the big issues that, I, that were patterns among most of the students. Um, here are some resources for them. And so really you get to provide this really in-depth response, but you're only having to compose it once and sort of think through it once. So yeah, so I'd say the copying, pasting, and then the global feedback, I think, are um, have worked well for me. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zoe. Yeah, thank you um, all so much. Yeah, thanks for joining. 
Yeah, I think um, in addition to what you've all said, um, I think frequent low stakes writing is also a great way to keep students engaged, um, especially in an online environment. So this is especially yeah. relevant to us these days as we deliver more courses online. So okay. thanks so much yeah. for the super timely session. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. We are almost at hour, so we're going to close the webinar now. Um, but if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out. And we look forward to seeing you in some of our future sessions. Thank you so much. Yeah, great. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Ciao.